Welcome to the Global Migration Center Lecture Series Podcasts. This podcast presents Richard Piotrovich, Professor of Law at Aberystwyth University, with his lecture entitled Human Trafficking and the Fallacy of Human Rights Violations. The conference is moderated by Professor Vincent Chetay. If you wish to keep informed about our activities, visit our website on www.graduateinstitute.ch slash gmc or connect with us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. We will uh, continue uh, today uh, our Global Migration Lecture Series that we in fact uh, supposed to to, to took place uh, uh, in last May uh, and because of COVID-19 we are to cancel and to organize uh, uh, it uh, online. And uh, uh, this is my great pleasure to have uh, Richard uh, Piotrovic uh, among us to discuss about uh, human trafficking and the fallacy of human rights violation. Um, human trafficking is obviously a key uh, uh, notion uh, related to uh, global migration and uh, with not only uh, widely ratified uh, 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 universal uh, UN conventions, but also uh, clearly trafficking is at the heart of the international agenda for various reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, the key interest of this discussion today is to uh, uh, a discussion about why human trafficking is not a violation of human rights. And this is very interesting because there is a common uh, uh, belief that uh, human rights, uh, that human trafficking is a violation of human rights. And I'm very pleased that uh, Wizards uh, will uh, uh, develop uh, uh, a counter uh, or alternative narrative about this because uh, um, equating human trafficking with human rights is a source of many misunderstanding and misperceptions among uh, uh, among uh, policy makers and also scholars. And uh, uh, most importantly, uh, I, I'm very pleased to have Rizat here, uh, uh, Rizat uh, Petrovic, because he is uh, uh, one or perhaps the key uh, world expert on human trafficking. Yeah? He was involved in this area uh, uh, since a while and he is a key reference on this uh, uh, important issue among, in fact, many other fields. Uh, I mean, like many scholars at the Graduate Institute, Rizad Petrovic is a true generalist, uh, 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 able to, uh, uh, he, he has done uh, uh, many interesting publications in various fields of international law, so not only human trafficking, but also uh, humanitarian law, for instance, uh, UN law, and many other areas. Um, and this is another reason why I'm uh, uh, very pleased to have uh, Riza Petrovic among, uh, among us. He's a professor of law at uh, Aberystwyth uh, University since 1999. Uh, before that, he was professor and dean at the law faculty of the University of Tasmania. And uh, uh, he uh, notably served two terms as member of the European Commission group of uh, experts on trafficking in human beings, and also uh, the Council of Europe group of experts on action against trafficking in human beings since uh, 2013. And uh, he has uh, widely uh, uh, worked as consultant, but also as scholar on many uh, issues related to trafficking. So this is a great honor to have uh, you, uh, Riza Petrovic, among us, and also to have, uh, uh, let's say, a different view uh, about uh, human trafficking. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, being uh, here uh, virtually uh, uh, and uh, for sharing uh, with, with, with us uh, your insights about human trafficking as uh, one of the key experts uh, on this uh, important uh, issue. So uh, I, I'm, super, uh, I, I'm pleased to give the floor to Wizard, and uh, then after his uh, presentation, his lecture, 
we will have uh, uh, time for a question and answer uh, session. Again, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who has uh, registered to take part in this meeting. I hope, I hope you'll think it's, it has been worth your while by the time I, I come to the end, if you're still listening, of course, by then. I'm really sorry that I cannot be in Geneva. I should have been giving this talk in Geneva in May, but we all know why that is, and I'm not any worse affected than anybody else. And in some ways, I'm probably better off, but it's still frustrating. And one of the reasons it's frustrating is I like to see my audience. I like to see the, the, the hatred or the approval in their eyes. And, of course, I can't see anything. I can see Vincent in the, in the little corner of my screen, but that's it. And that does make a difference because it is difficult to understand the extent to which one is actually communicating effectively with one's audience. But I'm going to try this afternoon or this evening to explain to you why – not only why I think that human trafficking is not a human rights violation, which is conceptually an important issue, but why I think it has significant practical ramifications, because I'm interested in how the law works in practice. And before I come to that in that context, I want to explain uh, one or two things to you. If, if I were in the room with you together, I would pick a few people out, and I would describe what trafficking is, and then I would ask if people think this is a a violation of human rights, and almost everybody will say yes because they don't want to say the wrong thing and look like they don't like traffic people or something like that. And I let a few people go on like this, and then I tell them that they're all wrong. And it's usually quite a, an interesting response, but I, I can't do that this evening. So I'm, I'm adopting a slightly different response. And before I come to that main issue, I want to tell you very briefly about the work I do for the Council of Europe. I'm, as Vassal said, I'm a member of GRETA, which is a Council of Europe's group of experts on action against trafficking in human beings. Uh, we are 15 members, and I'm the vice president, and will be till the end of this year. And our, our job, our real function, is to monitor how countries comply with their obligations under the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings that was adopted in Warsaw in 2005. The Convention now has 47 parties, every European country except Russia. And one or two countries outside Europe will probably accede to the Convention soon because, although it's a Council of Europe Convention, it's open to countries anywhere in the world. So our job is to monitor countries. And I have been, in my seven and a half years or so, as a member of GRETA, I have been monitoring countries from north to south of Europe, from west to east. I was in the team monitoring Switzerland two years ago in October two years ago. And what does that mean when we monitor? We go to the country. Well, not now, we don't. Uh, I'm supposed to be monitoring Latvia in a couple of weeks, but in fact, we will have some meetings online, and hopefully when things have improved, we should be able to make a physical visit to the country. But when we do go to the country, we go for about a week, and we look at what is taking place in detention camps, in shelters, we speak to NGOs, to the police, to law enforcement agencies, the ministries. We prepare the meeting very carefully by sending out a fairly detailed questionnaire, which uh, the country is obliged to respond to, and some respond to it. Uh, they all respond with plenty of words, but some respond with more accuracy than others. Let's put it like that. We were in Switzerland two years ago, as I said, so we will be there again in two, probably about two years. So this is what we do, and we really try to get as comprehensive a picture as possible of the state of affairs in each country with regard to law enforcement against trafficking, but also the protection and support of victims of trafficking. And it's this aspect of protection and support that will lead me on to the main point of my talk, and I hope enable me to explain to you and maybe even convince some of you why I am right and the rest of the world is wrong. So, what is trafficking in human beings? Um, don't worry, I'm not going to go through the legal definition. We don't have time for that. And if you don't know it, it doesn't really matter just now. I have prepared a short written uh, version of my talk, which is with the Institute, and I hope it's only about two and a half pages, and I hope that they can maybe make it available uh, online to anybody who wants it. I'll be very happy if they can do that. Um, now, 
trafficking, if, if we forget the law for a moment, think about what happens when somebody is trafficked. They are moved for the purpose of exploitation. Most of that can be sexual exploitation or labour exploitation. And for many years, and still I think to some extent, a lot of people, especially in the European context, when they think about human trafficking, they think about young women being trafficked, moved from Eastern Europe to Western Europe for sexual exploitation. And that happens. There is no doubt about it. But people are trafficked within countries as well. We have had a number of significant criminal trials in the United Kingdom, specifically in England in the last few years, of young English women being trafficked for sexual exploitation by British men of South Asian origin. Um, but in the UK and I think in some other countries, more trafficking is for different types of labour exploitation. You can get your car washed, we call it a car, hand car wash for £5 in the UK. Now, that's about €6. Euros. And I went, I took my car once, and the guys who were doing this were speaking Polish, which I also happened to speak. And I, I asked them a bit about how they got the job, and they were extremely reluctant to speak to me. And my, I suspect that they were being exploited in some way. People are trafficked for forced begging. If you see somebody in a big European city begging for money, there is a real chance that well, on the one hand, they may really need that money for themselves. On the other hand, they may be forced. They may be being forced to do that by somebody who is taking the money from them and will punish them if they do not obtain enough money on that particular day. And people are controlled through different types of coercion: physical coercion, sexual coercion, psychological coercion. If you imagine a woman being trafficked for exploitation and prostitution. You give her a mobile phone, and you tell her, look, if I call you, you must answer. And if she doesn't answer the first time, you go around and you beat her up badly. She'll answer after that. She'll, there's no problem. So we, you get an idea of kind of things that happens to people when they're trafficked. They're, they're extremely abused, extremely abused. Because you must understand there's nothing personal about this in most cases. The traffickers don't treat their, don't treat their victims like this because they don't like them. They're just commodities to be exploited. If they, could, if they could make more money by selling fruit or flowers, I'm sure they would. It's safer. But there's so much money to be made from trafficking in human beings. And you, you'll see, when, when you think about the types of exploitation I told you about, this is why people often say, well, trafficking is a violation of human rights. People are subjected to restrictions on their freedom. This, these types of violence is psychological coercion. And for sure, people are treated sometimes very, very badly indeed. And even the convention, which I am involved in monitoring, the Council of Europe Convention adopted in 2005, says in its preamble that trafficking is a violation of human rights. Uh, I, I regard this simply as a rhetorical device, because it's wrong. It does not stand up to scrutiny. And that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to scrutinize this claim that trafficking is a violation of human rights. Think about it this way. Why do people talk about trafficking as a violation of human rights? But they won't generally talk about murder or rape or theft as a violation of human rights. What is so special about human trafficking? Where, where does this come from? And it's very interesting because if you think again about what happens when a person is trafficked, who is doing the trafficking? Human beings are doing the trafficking. And they're obviously criminals, of course they're criminals, but they are private criminals. They're engaged in a private criminal enterprise. In the absence of some state involvement, such as, for example, a corrupt border official taking a bribe, or a corrupt police officer participating in the trafficking, this is just a private criminal enterprise, like you or I stealing a Mars bar from a shop, albeit on a much larger scale, or you or I killing somebody. It's, it's a criminal enterprise. So why is it described as a violation of human rights? Well, your guess is as good as mine. I, I, had, I had a kind of eureka moment about 10 years ago, and I was sober at the time, uh, which was unusual. But I had a kind of eureka moment when I suddenly realized that, and I had been arguing all along, yes, trafficking is a violation of human rights. In fact, I had not been arguing it. I had been assuming it. And I think it's actually quite lazy thinking, and I will explain why. Because, as I said earlier, when a person is trafficked, in almost all cases, the protagonists, the traffickers, 
are criminals. They're private criminals. They do not represent the state. Now, my view of human rights is that there are human rights duties owed by the state to those people within its jurisdiction. That is what is clearly the case under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 4 of which prohibits trafficking. Trafficking isn't specifically mentioned, but we know since 2010 that the prohibition of slavery, forced labour and servitude includes trafficking. So, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings establishes obligations for states, not for criminals. I mean, you could try to establish obligations for criminals, but they will ignore them. Human rights treaties contain duties owed by states. They always have since the, since the rapid expansion of human rights instruments that were adopted after World War II. We talk all the time about duties owed by the state to address this imbalance of power between the state and the individual. Now, the first big case to be decided by the European Court of Human Rights with regard to human trafficking was decided actually 10 years ago, in 2010, but in the case of Rantsev against Cyprus and Russia, where a young Russian woman had been trafficked to Cyprus and she actually died there very tragically. Now, when you look at what, the action, what actions were brought in that case by Oksana Rantseva's father against Cyprus and Russia, they were not because these countries had trafficked her, they were because they had allowed her to be trafficked. They had not protected her from being trafficked. They had failed to support her adequately when she sought help from after getting away from her traffickers. That was the failure. The trafficking itself was a crime. And one sees this, one finds support for this in a relatively recent decision of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales in 2015, where the leading judge said in the main judgment that referring to the European Convention on Human Rights, and this will be the one quote I have during this talk, so please bear with me. It's just a few lines. He said, the rights which the Convention guarantees are enjoyed against the state, and only the state. It's important to recognise that ill treatment by a non-state agent, however grave, does not of itself constitute a breach of Article 3. He was talking about at the time. This is sometimes glossed over in the language of the cases. Likewise, a killing does not of itself violate Article 2, nor an act of enslavement, Article 4, if it is not perpetrated by an agent of the state. But it is surely inherent in the Convention's purpose of the state is to protect persons within its jurisdiction against such brutalities, whoever inflicts them. I could not agree more. This is why the European Court of Human Rights found Cyprus and and to a lesser extent Russia, to be in violation of their obligations under Article 4 in failing to protect Oksana Rantseva from being trafficked and later from failing to protect her after she uh, escaped or got away from her traffickers. So what we see here is a clear recognition by the European Court of Human Rights, but by other tribunals as well, that when we're talking about the human rights aspect of human trafficking, it is not the trafficking itself that violates the convention or the obligation. It is the failure of the state to prevent the trafficking. It is the failure to support and protect the victims of trafficking that constitute a violation of Article 4 of the European Convention or the, the equivalent provisions of the American Convention and the African Charter and the ICCPR. So the state violation is because of its failure to act or its failure to take the necessary steps, its failure to protect in other words. And I think that this is extremely important. I, and it comes back to what I mentioned earlier about the, my role in monitoring states' compliance with their human rights obligations under the Council of Europe Convention. What do we do when we go to states? As I mentioned earlier, we've, we speak to everybody we can who has a, an interest in this or a role in this, including the NGOs, the government ministries, the law enforcement all of those people. And what we are talking about when we do this is we are looking for, we are looking to establish the extent to which each country has in actual fact complied with its obligations. First of all, under our convention, the European, the Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, because that is our mandate. But of course, 
although it is not in our mandate, it would also be relevant to the extent to which the state has violated Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So all the time when we're looking for violations, we're looking at the behaviour of the state, not of the traffickers. The traffickers for us are criminals. And I should say that not all of my colleagues in Greta agree with my analysis, but they all accept that when we go to monitor a country, when we visit that country, we are looking at the behaviour of the state, not of the traffickers. And for me, this is a very, very important uh, distinction to make. So what I'm doing here is I'm explaining to you conceptually why I think this is important. We need to understand where the human rights violation is actually taking place. But let me turn now to the practical ramifications of this. And this is really my second main point and my final main point, because you shouldn't have too many main points, I think, especially at this time of the day. Now, when we're looking at the human rights duties or obligations of states towards people who have been trafficked or who are at risk of being trafficked, because the obligation is also to prevent trafficking, if possible, this is where it becomes practically very important. Imagine you work for an NGO or you work for some other body that wants to bring pressure upon state agencies, which are not doing enough to protect traffic people, or not doing enough to support them. Perhaps they're not providing the funding that they're supposed to provide for a shelter for traffic people. Perhaps the, the, the vice squad or the, the police dealing with trafficking are not given enough resources to do their job properly, because, of course, there's always demand, competing demands for resources. Maybe, in fact, the law of the particular country is not, in, is not consistent with the country's obligations under the Council of Europe Convention or, in some cases, the relevant European Union law as well. All, are the, all of these can lead to human rights violations by the state because it is not formally subject in compliance or, in real terms, it is not in compliance and traffic people are not being adequately protected or they're not being adequately supported, or the trafficking is not being prevented, but it could and should be prevented. Now, of course, I'm not saying there's an absolute obligation upon the state to prevent trafficking. We all know from the case law of the court, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg that there is never an absolute obligation upon the state. That is not realistic, nor fair, nor reasonable. But the state does have an obligation to do what it reasonably can, to give full effect to its obligations under the Convention, whichever obligations these are. And here, of course, I'm speaking about Article 4. So what does this mean in practice? Imagine that you're working for an NGO or for some other body which is trying to help traffic people. Maybe you're a lawyer. You want the state to comply with its obligations. You don't go to the traffickers. You go to the state and you say, you are in violation of this provision of the Council of Europe Convention or that provision of the Council of Europe Convention or some other our instrument, you might even cite Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but the advantage of the Council of Europe Convention is that it contains much more detailed uh, provisions on the extent of and scope of states' obligations to assist and protect traffic people or to prevent them from being trafficked in the future. So these, this is the practical, these are the practical ramifications of understanding where the human rights obligations lie. If I were a, a government lawyer, I would laugh my head off as somebody who came and spoke to me uh, about tr uh, trafficking being a violation of human rights, I, I would let them go on believing that, because as long as they're doing that, they are not really explaining to me where my obligations are and tying, trying to pin me down to, make a, to adhere to or to comply with my obligations. And it goes further than the issue of support and protection within the state. Think, those of you who are interested in refugee law or the law of international protection, please think about this point. Many trafficked people are trafficked to other countries. Many trafficked people are at risk of being trafficked to other countries for sexual or labour exploitation. And once they're in the other country, they may, hopefully will, one day escape from their traffickers or be freed from their trafficking situation. But they might well be a foreign in that country. They might be from a non-EU country if, and in an EU country. My point is they might not have any rights to remain in that country beyond perhaps a limited period while they're assisting with the prosecution. But it may not be safe for them to go back to their home country. Remember, they were, they were 
first recruited in their home country in the first place. The traffickers may know their family, they may know where they come from. They may even have been trafficked by a relative. It happens. My point to you is that it may not, in actual fact, be safe for that person to return to her or his home country because of a threat to their life or to their human rights coming not from the state but from the traffickers. But we know that under international refugee law or the law of international protection, if you like, and this is recognised in the EU's qualification directive, that, in fact, when it comes to assessing entitlement to international protection, be it refugee status or complementary or subsidiary protection, that the threat from a non-state agent can also be relevant if the state is unable or unwilling to protect the trafficked person. Now, what we then therefore have to do is to consider which country that trafficked person has come from, let's call it X, and we would have to make an assessment whether she or he could be returned safely to State X. And by safely, I don't mean that they land at the airport or get across the border safely, but rather that they are successfully reintegrated. And that costs time, it costs effort, and it costs a bit of money as well. So this is also where the human rights dimension, if you like, of human trafficking comes in. So I'm not saying to you that human rights and trafficking have nothing to do with each other. I think they have an awful lot to do with each other. But my point to you, and this is really where I think I should finish, my point to you is that it is not the trafficking itself that violates the human rights. It is a failure of the state to provide the support, to provide the protection, to have the necessary legal regime in place in some cases, to provide the resources which enable that support to and protection to happen, to provide the funding for the shelters which they are promised to do. These sorts of things. And our convention, meaning the Council of Europe Convention adopted in Warsaw, sets out in substantial detail what states are supposed to do. And that applies to every country in Europe apart from Russia. And remember, this is relevant for countries all over the world, because the victims do not come just from Europe. They come from Africa, South America, Asia, maybe not from Antarctica, but they come from just about everywhere else. So this has worldwide importance, in my opinion. Now, I've spoken not quite for 30 minutes, but I think about 25. But I, I think I might stop there because I've made the essential points that I wanted to make. And I hope if you have some questions or comments, I'll do my best to try to respond or to answer, answer them. So thank you very, very much for listening. I, I'm just sorry that we could not actually be in the same room together. Thank you very much, Richard, for your very clear uh, lecture, uh, as usual. Uh, I mean, before uh, giving the floor to uh, to uh, those who are uh, watching you, uh, maybe uh, two two brief questions uh, from my side because your your lecture was very intriguing. Uh, first of all, so uh, this is not about human rights, but about the failure of state to protect. Okay, failure of, of states to protect victims of trafficking. So, uh, in accordance with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, vertical application of human rights. Uh, uh, but what about, because, I, I, I mean, I discussed this in previous publications, previous books and articles in link with uh, private military uh, security companies and then also in the context of multinational companies, but I think it could be uh, a way to challenge your very interesting uh, uh, point. Because assuming that there is a duty, and this is alongside what I developed uh, before, assuming that there is a failure of state protection, uh, a failure of state to protect victims of trafficking, the very fact that there is such a failure of state protection means that the human rights are applicable horizontally uh, between individuals, and in this case, between traffickers and, and, uh, and trafficked persons. Because without such violation, there is no due diligence and no uh, uh, duty for, for state to protect. So we can counter argue. I mean, this is very uh, theoretical, and I will come back on more uh, uh, practical questions, but from a, a, a conceptual perspective, we can argue alongside the duty of due diligence that the failure of state protection requires violation, 
And because it requires violation, uh, therefore, human rights are plainly applicable between the traffickers and the traffic persons. This is my first question, quite uh, quite uh, academic, but uh, I mean, uh, still uh, 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 as a way to, uh, to play the developed vocate uh, 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 link to your very interesting argument. And my second question is, Fair state protection uh, 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 of the state of destination or the state of origin? Could we argue, because on the basis of the different examples you, 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 you gave, I think that it would be also interesting uh, uh, to have your views about not only the failure of the state of destination, because as you mentioned, most traffic persons, in fact, are uh, non-nationals, uh, and coming from one country to another. So clearly, trafficking is a failure of the state of destination as such, the state of, uh, of, of the territorial presence. And what about the responsibility of the state of origin? Uh, it, it happens just because uh, uh, <laughs> what you, you, you say. So if you can uh, uh, maybe just share your views. Yeah. Yes, thank you for those. I will address your first question first and then come to the second one. It seems to me that what you're suggesting with regard to the failure of st state protection, creating, if you like, a human rights obligation between the trafficker and the victim amounts to horizontal application of human rights. And if you believe in that, then sure, then everything is a violation of human rights. And I think one diminishes the whole value and importance of human rights. When I steal your Mars bar, I'm violating your human rights across if I want to be trivial, or when I murder you, not you personally, but somebody else, I'm violating that person's right to life. For sure, I'm taking that person's life. But the, the European Convention on Human Rights did not place an obligation upon me. It placed an obligation upon states to protect and to ensure protection. So if I do take somebody's life, then, and that is because, for example, of a failure of the police or the, to provide uh, protection when it would have been reasonable to expect that, then we have not only a crime, in my view, but also possibly a human rights violation. If, on the other hand, I'm just I'm walking home one night and somebody at random uh, murders me, stabs me, or shoots me to death, then it is very unlikely that one can say that, that was a violation of human rights because that can happen anywhere with any fault or lack of due diligence, if you like, on the part of the state. So that would be my response to you. I, I know I, I recognise that we could go on discussing this yeah, in, sure. in, more, in more detail, but I, I, for me, there is further support from what I said in all of the Article 4 cases at the European Court of Human Rights. They're all about the failure of the state, not about anything that there's the failure of the state to protect traffickers or to protect the victims. That's the human rights aspect for me. Um, if I may move on to your second question, failure by whom? It's very clear to me that if somebody's trafficked from state A to state B, there is potential responsibility in both countries, depending upon what actually happens. Um, because the person was recruited in state A. One has to look at the circumstances in which she or he was recruited. But, for example, in the case of Rancev against Cyprus and Russia, the, the claim against Russia was that Russia as a state of origin, had failed to prevent Oksana Rancieva from being recruited into possible exploitation in Cyprus. She, so that, that was the very argument put forward uh, against Russia in that case. So it is very clear to me that when we're looking at somebody who's been trafficked transnationally, we need to consider the possible responsibility of the home state, first of all, for failing to protect this. And this is has to happen every single time. But then we also have to consider the possible responsibility of the destination country. And I, I would say at this stage that the fact that somebody is trafficked from, say, country A into country B does not mean that country B has, is automatically responsible at the moment that person has been exploited because country B might not have had the opportunity to do anything about this. Or they, they may have good systems in place, but they simply do not identify it. And, but once they become aware, or if they ought to be aware, then for sure there are, there are issues there. And, for example, we see now, 
very small ways in which states do things about this. I see it more and more and more airports. I haven't been to the airport since February, and I'm very frustrated about it. But in the, in the, in the good old days, when we all lived and travelled and did human things, I saw in a number of airports posters um, which were targeted at possible victims of trafficking, asking them, did they want to travel? Had they just arrived? Were they, did they know who was going to meet them? That kind of thing. Very practical measures taken by destination countries or sometimes origin countries to, to try to uh, bring in practical measures to try to prevent people being trafficked. I even, I even saw it myself in the, in the gents' toilets in Birmingham Airport. There was a sign up, do you want to travel? And if not, call this number and, to, and give your location. So that this was, for me, in a very small way, the United Kingdom trying to give effect to its obligation to prevent human trafficking, even if the person who designed the poster was not aware that there's an obligation to do so. So there, there are obligations also on, on transit states. People might be trafficked from country A through two other countries to country B. And there might well be, this was an issue, if I can briefly bring this up, when we were monitoring certain countries um, in 2016, so after the big wave of migration uh, across the Mediterranean in 2015. And we were not, we were interested in finding out from certain countries that were on the transit route what measures they were able to take to identify trafficked people or people at risk of being trafficked in this wave, very large wave of migration. And in one country, quite a small country, they said, look, <laughs> we know those people just wanted to get through our territory to move on. We have a very small number of people who do this job. We were, we were frankly overwhelmed. It was not possible for us to identify anybody who might be at risk we, it, because of the sheer numbers. And it was a reasonable point in those circumstances. But in normal circumstances, I would say all countries where traffic people can be have a responsibility to them. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, several questions. Uh, I, I will uh, start by two uh, 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 from the audience. Uh, first, the first question, let me find. Why has Russia not joined the Council of Europe Convention? Uh, and uh, the second one relates about where is the line between a state failure to protect and a poor practice with protection. So, when clearly uh, this is uh, uh, here an interesting uh, and not easy distinction between uh, failure uh, and poor uh, failure to uh, how uh, to distinguish between state failure to protect uh, versus poor practice uh, of the, uh, okay. the protection. Yeah. Okay. I will start with uh, C2 once. Uh, yeah. Why has Russia, why has the Russian Federation not acceded to or signed the Council of Europe Convention? I don't know. And I don't think anybody in Strasbourg quite knows. And I'm not sure that anybody in Russia knows either, to, to be frank. I'm, it, I'm aware that uh, certain attempts have been made to encourage Russia to, to join the convention. And there does not appear to have been a substantial amount of interest from Russia at all. And I'm not, so I'm not able to give you a substantive reason why that is. Every other country in Europe has, has signed up, which is quite a remarkable rate. And remember, the convention was only adopted in 2005. So we, we've done quite well. Um, obviously, if Russia were to exceed that, that would change the dynamic Significantly, because the Russia is such a country, and you could not do. A, I think I don't know how one could do a country visit to Russia in one working week, which is the amount of time that we actually spend to take it. And there's another issue, which is that, um, related, which I maybe should have mentioned earlier. Greta has 15 members. We are elected from around Europe, so not every country is no country, in fact, is guaranteed to have a person of its nationality on Greta, and we sit as independent members. And the, so Russia would have to, if it were, if it signed a convention, would have to compete on equal terms with every other country if it wanted to get a Russian citizen elected. 
So I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Um, but that, at least I've confessed how much I, my ignorance extends. Um, the next question was, and uh, what, I was asked to comment on the, the line between state failure to protect and poor practice and protection. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting question, and I, I will. The, the, the one thing that occurs to me to respond in response to that is, that if we talk about the state failure to protect, the very word failure, which is what you used, suggests that there has been a violation of the state's obligations under whether it be the Council of Europe Convention or the European Convention on Human Rights or some other instrument. Whereas poor practice will not, in my view, could be, could amount to a violation of the treaty because, because of a breach of a particular provision, but not necessarily because not every example of poor practice is necessarily so poor as to constitute a violation of a state's obligations. So that would, if, I, I, I hope I hope I've responded. I hope this is the kind of response that you were expecting, because that would be my understanding. The line is: Do you do, do you cross the line to violate, or don't you? And poor practice means for me that the state could be doing better, but it's not necessarily in violation of its obligations. Okay. So, for instance, a state could give more money to finance shelters for trafficked people. The fact that it gives less does not mean that it's in violation of its obligations. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, so several other questions. Uh, uh, an intriguing one, uh, and uh, are there any examples where, in fact, a state itself has engaged in trafficking? Uh, are there any examples where the state itself has engaged in trafficking? Uh, I, 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 I believe that in the Old Testament there was an issue of the Israelis being trafficked by, by uh, the Egyptians. But in modern times, uh, that is trafficking, I think. Nazi Germany engaged in trafficking, although we didn't have the definition of trafficking in, during the Second World War that we have today. That was adopted in two, the year 2000. I think that the Soviet Union engaged in trafficking. I think that the Islamic State engaged in trafficking. That's not a state as we understand it, but it called itself a state. And the deliberate trafficking, targeting and trafficking of Yazidi women for sexual exploitation, to take a more modern example, it's possible that China is doing that with regard to the Uyghur minority. Uh, so is, is it happening? Almost certainly. But I think that... Uh, in a less obvious way, we can we can say that a state is not trafficking, but a state can be responsible where a state agent engages in it. For example, we had in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we had members of K4 who uh, U.S. members of K4 who were almost certainly involved in trafficking for sexual exploitation. Not just Americans, but I'm aware of that that case. So it does happen. Now the United States as a state did not conduct a policy of human trafficking, but American forces did. And we have corrupt police officers in some countries who engage in different roles and different capacities in trafficking. We have corrupt border officials. And in one country that I will not name, but you can probably find it pretty easily on the internet, uh, a former prime minister uh, is accused of having been involved in trafficking for the purpose of transplant of human organs. And, but you, you can Google that one and see. I, I don't want to mention any particular countries here, uh, apart from the Soviet Union and China and Russia and, and America and so on. Okay. Uh, another, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, question about the criminalization of traffickers uh, and the possibility, uh, uh, I mean, what do you think about the possibility to use, instead of criminal prosecution, civil litigation against traffickers? Yeah. So, uh, 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 one question. And second, another one, I mean, there are many others, but and another one, uh, 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 is your approach uh, uh, can be transposed to slavery? Okay. Uh, let me take the second one first. Is, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually, in the United Kingdom and Australia and some other countries, 
Human trafficking is sometimes referred to as modern-day slavery. It's even in the British and the Australian legislation. I don't like that. I think it's a mistake. But I think that ship has sailed. And I'll tell you why I don't like it. And this is not just my idea. I got the idea from a man called Mike Dottridge, who used to be one of the top legal people at Anti-Slavery International, uh, who is an extremely, who thinks quite deeply about human trafficking. And Mike Dottridge's point, and I entirely agree with him, is that it's unfortunate to call human trafficking modern-day slavery, whichever language you want to use, be it English, French, or whatever. Because when people think about slavery, they think about people in chains. They think about people subjected to the most extreme exploitation. And yet human trafficking, bad as it is, does not have to be so extreme. It could be somebody who's been forced to work 12 hours a day in a car wash and actually being kept in horrible conditions and not being, being paid some money to survive, but not all the money they earn. They're not slaves in the sense, in the old sense. They're not enslaved, but they're still trafficked. And that's why, so human trafficking covers a broader range of exploitation than slavery does. And that's why I don't like the term modern slavery, because I think it detracts attention from just how extensive the exploitation is that can be caused through human trafficking. Uh, now, the second point was, what about using civil litigation instead of prosecution? Absolutely, and it happens. Um, the fact that somebody is prosecuted does not deny the traffic person the right to bring a civil case, for example, for false imprisonment or battery or whatever the equivalent is in other legal systems. But let me tell you, but in fact, the record in European countries of victims of trafficking getting effective access to compensation and then actually getting compensation is extremely poor. And that's both in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe with one or two uh, notable exceptions. Because imagine you're a trafficked person. Let's say you've been trafficked to a foreign country for sexual or labour exploitation, and you're freed from that situation. You even know who your trafficker is, but you don't speak the local language. How are you going to do this? First of all, you need to know your rights. Secondly, you need to be able to speak the language to know your rights, or you need to have an interpreter who will help you. You need to know the system. I have I have three law degrees, and I wouldn't know how to bring a claim for compensation in the United Kingdom. I would need to get professional advice. You maybe don't know the language. You may be quite naive. You maybe have very limited education. You don't have a permanent per, you don't have long term permission to remain in the country. Uh, you don't have access to people with the know how about how to do this. In reality, in reality, getting effective access to compensation is. A joke. It's a fairy tale. Walt Disney is more likely to achieve it than a lot of traffic people in Europe today. It is not entirely like that, but it is mostly like that. Thank you. Uh, uh, another question that is, uh, of course, uh, well, extremely important uh, uh, about the distinction between trafficking and smuggling. I mean, we can discuss this uh, during several months. Uh, so. Uh, maybe to have your view about uh, the, 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 the dividing line, how distinguish yeah. the two, uh, uh, given the clause overlapping uh, as a reality as such uh, mm. between uh, 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 smuggling of migrants and trafficking. In, in yeah. Sure. The, the, there, there's a clear legal distinction between trafficking and smuggling, and I will briefly explain what that is, but then I will explain why, in reality, sometimes it is difficult to make that distinction. First of all, smuggling can only be from one country to another. It has to be international. Trafficking can be within one country. But the core difference is that a, traffic, a person cannot legally consent to being trafficked. They cannot legally consent to that exploitation. Whereas you can consent to be smuggled. If I pay somebody two or three thousand euro to get me from Libya across the Mediterranean to Italy, if I do that willingly, maybe I think I have no choice, but I still give the smuggler that money to get me across. And then when I get to Italy, I'm free to go. Well, I've been smuggled. I'm not exploited in the sense that a trafficked person is exploited. However, sometimes somebody who thinks that she or he is being smuggled is in fact being trafficked. 
So let us say I've paid this three thousand euro to this person in Libya, and when I get to Italy, I find that I'm not free to go. In fact, some people are waiting for me and a few others, and I'm taking off in a van to work on a tomato, uh, to work on a tomato farm somewhere in southern Italy, and I'm exploited. So I believed I was being smuggled, but in fact, I've been trafficked from the very beginning because the smuggler, the apparent smuggler, had already organised this. And then, you, just to complicate things a little bit further, you get some people who really do start off being smuggled, but end up being trafficked. For example, somebody who's being smuggled from sub-Saharan Africa to Libya with the aim to get to Europe. But on the way, somebody uh, somebody kidnaps them, and then they're subjected, they're kept and exploited, they're sexually exploited. That then becomes probably trafficking, although it started off being smuggling. So the two are legally quite different, but they are very close in reality, and they can be confused, or sometimes it can be difficult to tell the difference. And the interesting thing is when, in the year 2000, the UN adopted the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, which nearly every country in the world has, has ratified or acceded to. At the same time, it adopted two protocols. One was in trafficking in human beings, and one was in smuggling in human beings. And they've both attracted very widespread support. The trafficking protocol a bit more than the smuggling one, but both very widespread. Not clearly, and also uh, uh, another difficulty is to have uh, uh, domestic legislation able to do the distinction between the two, because uh, in practice uh, this is uh, not uh, necessarily clear cut. And uh, even if exploitation is a core content of uh, trafficking, but uh, I mean uh, many smuggled migrants are exploited too. So clearly, uh, uh, so, so the dividing line uh, is quite porous in, in, in practice, and has raised a lot of uh, of concern. Um, there, there is a, a, a question. Uh, uh, that uh, about uh, and uh, uh, about so if, uh, uh, if uh, it is is it safe to ask, I'm reading the question is it safe to assume from the lecture that human violations are mere consequences of human trafficking? Um, could, could you read that once more, please? Yeah. Is it safe to assume from the lecture that human violations, human rights violations, I mean are uh, uh, mere consequences of uh, trafficking. Uh, so, is it safe to assume from the lecture that human rights violations are mere consequences of trafficking? No, it is not. Uh, human rights violations are, first of all, a cause of trafficking, where a state fails to protect people from being trafficked, where it fails to have in place legislation which adequately criminalises and deters trafficking, where it fails to provide the resources for law enforcement to uh, try to address trafficking, that causes trafficking or it allows trafficking to happen. So there, in my view, the human rights violation is not the consequence but the cause, uh, for sure. Uh, can the human rights violation? Can can we say that a human rights violation is a consequence of somebody being trafficked? Yes. If, for instance, somebody has been trafficked and the person is freed from that situation and the state fails to provide the support and protection it should, including possible international protection, then that can be a human rights violation. Mm -hmm. So once again, I'm coming back to always the, the failure by the state to do something or perhaps doing something differently from what it should. That is where we see the human rights violation. <coughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much for 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 your answer. I mean, we can also contradict you that from the angle of the legal definition of trafficking, uh, forced labor and slavery are, are human rights violations per se. But I, I, I just want to bring up on the, <laughs> the, the the debate. This is uh, a, a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Here and uh, I mean, uh, so, um, this uh, lecture, just to uh, as a reminder, this lecture has been recorded and uh, the recording will be uh, available uh, soon. Uh, um, 
And uh, I will take maybe a last question uh, to, to, to finish, uh, not as a, as a most uh, easy one, but uh, uh, in you, and uh, I'm reading it. Uh, can the impact of COVID-19 uh, increase human, uh, uh, human trafficking? Yeah, that's a very important question, actually. And the, the body of which our Vice President Greta actually has published a statement on the increased risks for, for people of being trafficked because of COVID-19. And we are not the only ones to have done so, but there's widespread uh, recognition that this COVID-19 can cause risks, increased risks for some trafficked people. Why? Well, imagine there's much less movement just now. There's lockdown, so there's less scope for people who are in certain traffic situations to be spotted. Let us say, for example, you've been trafficked for uh, exploitation of domestic labour. You're, you're maybe even more more enclosed than you were before. You're not able to go out. So there's that kind of risk. The, the labour inspectorates are not able to do their job as easily, so they're less likely to find traffic people exploited in the work situation. Um, medical staff are not always able to work as easily as they can, and they might not, uh, they might not traffic people who have been injured or who are ill might not be brought to them. And these are people who might identify somebody who has been trafficked. There are many ways in which this is problematic. There's one way, in my view, which doesn't often get mentioned, where the trafficking might have been for some time inhibited by, by the, the lockdown in March, which occurred in most of Europe. Uh, later, in the UK and other places, which, shows, which can be seen from the incompetence with which it has been handled in the United Kingdom. But arguably, the lockdown made it more difficult to actually transfer or transport some people for exploitation. Because borders were closed. Of course, people could be exploited within their own country, but even within a lot of countries, travel was severely restricted. Where I live in Wales, in the whole of Wales, which is about the size of Latvia, and it's about 3 million people, uh, for a long time nobody was supposed to go more than about 8 kilometres from where they lived. Now, in a big city, you can still do quite a lot within 8 kilometres, but in a, in a rural area, you're much more restricted. And people are trafficked for exploitation, for example, in agriculture. So COVID-19 has had potentially, I think, a very significant impact. I'm not aware of any studies yet which have already been able to measure that, but I'm, I'm sure that they will, they will be produced in due course. So your question, thank you for asked that. It's a very interesting and a, and a very relevant question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to, to stop now and uh, thank you warmly about your presentation. Uh, uh, I, I really hope that we will have uh, an occasion in uh, the post-COVID-19 world to uh, see you in person and to have uh, a conference in person here at Geneva. Uh, thank you again for uh, your very interesting, intriguing uh, uh, Lecture. It is always a pleasure to to, to have you, and uh, uh, we will uh, 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 share also the record, but also with your permission, uh, uh, the the short text you have prepared. If we can also uh, 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 put it on on your website, uh, 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 it will be great because there is a need. There is a need of evidence-based knowledge in this area uh, that is, uh, I mean, a reality that is uh, and, and a real, uh, not only a sad reality, but also at the heart of many uh, uh, ambiguities and, uh, and difficulties uh, of uh, the migration process also, uh, more generally, and, uh, and the notion of forced labor also. So thank you very much, Richard Petrovich. Thank you again, and uh, I, I will be very pleased to, to see you in person. Thank you. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to you and to the audience this evening uh, from from my house, but in Geneva. And I've enjoyed it very much, and I very much appreciate the, the questions and the comments that came from, from the audience, and I'll be delighted if you wish to make the, the text that I sent you available. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much.